Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's presentation of Ender Understanding ADSB and Active Traffic. My name is Jeff Simon. I'm president of Social Flight. For those of you joining us for the first time, Social Flight is the free web and mobile app dedicated to supporting general aviation. Visit socialflight.com or download the Social Flight mobile app for Apple and Android devices, and you'll have free access to over 10,000 aviation events destinations, and airport restaurants. You'll even get a weekly email with a list of all of the aviation events happening in your area. Our mission is to give pilots like yourselves more reasons to get out there and fly. Now, in addition to events you can fly to, we also have online events, which is why we are all here this evening. One of Socialite's partners is L3 Aviation Products, makers of the Lynx NGT9000 multi-link surveillance system, among many other impressive products. I've been fortunate to have a lot of experience with the Lynx, including installing it and flying it in Social Flight's A36 Bonanza. So I'm excited to have the opportunity to talk to you this evening about traffic technology as a whole and also about the Lynx. And I'll be joined by my good friend, Dennis McColl from L3 here as well. I'll go to the slide here and show you both of ours. Before we get started, here's a few tips. Uh, a recording of tonight's presentation will be available on socialflight.com within 24 hours. We'll send you a link by email after the presentation, and it'll also be available on YouTube at Social Flight's page with a recording for you. Feel free to post questions during the presentation in the chat area. We will have a Q&A session at the end with any questions that you have. We'll do our best to get those answered. So let's get started. Uh, taking a look uh, first, uh, what, these are the issues that we're, that we're going to cover and the topics that we're going to cover this evening. Um, you'll also notice uh, that uh, uh, we're um, not joined this evening, but uh, the dealer sponsor for L3 is Aspen Avionics. And uh, there, in addition to going to an L3 dealer, you can actually also go to Aspen and get questions answered and get products through one of their dealers. Now, we're going to talk about a number of things this evening, including display versatility and really the topic of choice, of course, of what is it that, that uh, how exactly does ADS-B versus active traffic work, and what are some of the important things to consider so that you can be as safe as possible with this technology, and we'll try to cover all of those in tonight's presentation. Let's start with a, a quick look at our A36 panel here. Now, as I mentioned, um, I personally have installed and been flying with the L3 Link system for some time. And one of the things that I wanted to point out here is about display versatility. Um, I am a big believer in choosing the best of breed products that possible when you're out there and you want to get the best panel and you want the ability to look at all the different avionics on the market and make sure that they interconnect well and be able to upgrade things. And, and that's exactly what I've done to our panel here at Social Flight. Uh, it's important to me that when I'm looking at the primary flight display, I get what I think is the best out there, and then I can upgrade it as things happen. The same is true of the Navigator. And that's exactly what happened with, when it came to our transponder. Um, we actually had a transponder and then actually even had one that was uh, going to be ADS-B capable and chose to upgrade to the L3 links because we wanted a dedicated uh, display for hazards in particular. And that's something that I would encourage everyone to consider when you're looking at your strategy for your panel. Um, whether that incorporates an iPad or whether that's your primary flight display or navigator, et cetera, one of the really important things to consider is what are you using each of your displays for in flight? This especially matters in high workload environments and single pilot IFR flight. In my case, I look at the primary flight display as being what I'm using very, very tact, uh, tactically, using for the attitude, of course, of the aircraft, but real immediate decisions that I'm making when navigating courses and approaches. When I look at my navigator, that's where I'm looking at slightly larger range of what's happening, and that, of course, changes during flight as to what phase of flight you're using, how far out you're looking, et cetera. 
And then the reason that I am such a big fan of the NGT 9000, the link system gives you that extra display area that is dedicated to hazards at all times. And so one of the things that I have found is that I'm always changing ranges depending on my phase of flight of things. It's like I said, especially the navigator between long range on route travel versus approach or something like that. And those ranges are not always conducive to things like immediate traffic that's happening in your local area. So you can't have two different scales at the same time on any one display. If you're going to look at a very wide area for navigation, then it's really concentrating down and cramming in all of your traffic. We don't have to worry about that in the case of having a dedicated hazard display through the link system. And one of the things to consider about that is that if you if you look at things like uh, navigators, let's take for an example, the display area itself, the difference between getting a navigator that uh, has a small version of a navigator versus a large screen version of the same type of navigator on the market from different manufacturers tends to be somewhere around four to $5,000 just to buy a little bit more display area. And that display—that's because that display area is very valuable in flight. And yet, for the same amount of money, pretty much, as, as other uh, ADSB transponder systems, you now have that extra two inches of display area that you can actually focus on hazards. And so I just wanted to take a quick minute as we're getting started just to show you why I chose this and what our setup is. And that logic there is because display area is so valuable. And even though it is certainly possible with many products on the market to display on your iPad, I am personally not a big fan of looking down towards my lap for my hazard display at the same time as I'm trying to look outside the cockpit for where that traffic intercept and, and risk is going to be, as, as well as the fact of, uh, you know, them trying to navigate at the same time. So that's coming specifically from me and just giving you some examples and reasons as to why I tend to uh, really be a fan of that. So let's talk a little bit about ADSB traffic risk. Now, ADSB is a really wonderful, impressive technology and everything that it can do for us. And uh, that said, with all the information it gives you, it's in the world that we live in today, meaning 2019, it, it is not flawless. It is not without challenges in order to have a perfect picture of what's happening around you from a traffic perspective. And that is for a few different reasons. So one of the things, the first one we can certainly solve, and that's interpretation of data, and we're going to talk about that uh, tonight. But the other things are a few things, some of which are particular to ADSB and some of which are not. So first of all, you've got challenges in terms of ADSB has two different frequencies. Now, uh, good high-end avionic systems such as the Lynx are listening on both of those frequencies when they're looking for traffic. They're listening on 978, which is also known as UAT, and that's, of course, what gives us our FISB weather and everything else. They're also listening on the other frequency, which goes uh, worldwide, which is 1090. And there, therefore, when you're listening to traffic from another aircraft directly, we'll explain that a little bit more further on, then the link system can talk to any one of those and see that traffic. But it is important for you to know that there are products on the market that are one or the other and do not listen on both. And that's important to know when you're deciding what it is that you're going to purchase so you can make sure that you are able to hear both types of traffic um, directly. And then we'll talk about why it matters that you hear it directly instead of um, with the help of, of uh, air traffic control. The next one is non-ADSB traffic. So uh, it's 2019. We haven't met the mandate yet. Uh, there are still aircraft out there that are non-ADSB compliant. And I'd be willing to wager that after the deadline at 2020, <laughs> there is still going to be a fair number of aircraft out there that are non-ADSB compliant aircraft. And in addition to that, there are air spaces uh, that will not necessarily require a uh, certain aircraft 
to be ADSB compliant as well. So what that means is we've got non-participatory aircraft and you're not going to see those on ADSB unless they are spotted by another system, another air traffic control system, processed, sent back up to you, and then you see it. Again, we'll talk about that when we get a little further. And that is related directly to the next bullet point, which is if you're out of range of a ground station, an ADSB ground station, that is the stopgap in the ADSB system. The ground stations out there um, allow the processing of these different sources, including the different frequencies of ADSB, put it, all that information together and send it back up to you as an ADSB receiving customer airborne. And so as long as you're within range of a ground station, you are in very good shape. Uh, but uh, if you're not, then you have to think about other technologies, and we'll talk about that as well. And then the last one is pilot data overload. This also goes to my earlier statement about segmenting your displays and thinking about a strategy for what you want to display where. If we look at that, those screens that I uh, talked about in, in our aircraft, uh, I can put ADSB data with weather and traffic on every display. But what that really would do is, if you think about it, they'd get very crowded very quickly. If all my weather, all my traffic, all my information, BTARS tasks, next, uh, you know, everything's all on every single display, then that's a lot of information to process. And the question is, can I really make sure that I have my navigation information front of mind, or is it really best if I start to clear out those things and kind of segment them, as I spoke about earlier, because that overload presents a risk. So let's take a look at the system. This is a little bit complicated, um, and so I just want to make sure people kind of understand generally what's happening. So if we stop at the, start at the, the top of the food chain, one of the best parts of ADSB is aircraft to aircraft communications that just happen automatically. If you've got an ADSB equipped aircraft flying and another ADSB equipped aircraft flying in its proximity, and as long as both of those aircraft communicate on the same ADSB frequency, they see each other. You don't need ground station involved. You don't need anything involved, and uh, you will be able to. They, they can they can take care of their own uh, alerting to each other. Very very important thing that can actually happen there. Now, what also happens, of course, let's assume you're everybody's within range of a ground station. Those aircraft communicate all their information, all their ADSB information, very very accurate. WASP GPS position information speed information, identification of the type of aircraft, all of that information goes down to a ground station, and then it gets processed, put together with everything else, and spit back up to everybody, which is great. That happens to include a couple things. It includes these two things that we call ADSR and TISB, and those are basically ADSR. That's how, if one person's on one frequency, the FAA listens to it, ATC listens to it, and sends it back out on the other frequency does a repeater so everybody can see everybody else. The other one is TISB. We'll get to there in one second, but that is the catch-all that puts everything together. So now let's look at some of the other players that are out there in the market uh, or in the, in the skies above us. If we go to, that, to our lower left, we have these outliers right now, which are non-ADSB equipped aircraft. These are these can be both, actually. These can be aircraft that are flying with a standard mode A or C transponder. And in some areas, they can be aircraft with no transponder. If you want to look at someone that's flying around there that has, uh, uh, it could even be an, an, an antique aircraft or something like that that has no electrical system. If they happen to be within range of a primary radar station, so primary radar this is what you get on, uh, look, at, look at the old movies and you see the big, big dish spinning in circles. That's primary radar. And uh, there aren't a lot of them out there, but if you're in a controlled airspace, you may have one of those that actually goes up there and sees an aircraft that maybe doesn't even have a transponder. Now it's tracking its location as well. That information from transpo regular mode AC transponders and primary radar targets comes down and then goes into a control station 
gets all packaged together, and all that information gets sent up to ADSB aircraft on TISB. So that way you can see everything that's out there on TISB. Now, one thing to keep in mind is we don't know everything about all those aircraft, so we only have certain information. If it's an ADSB aircraft, well, we have all the information we talked about before. If it's an aircraft with a mode C transponder, well, then air traffic control knows its altitude because that's part of mode C transponder technology. And so we can send that up to ADSB aircraft and say, here's everybody and here's their altitude. But if it's a primary target that we're just pinging like old school World War II radar, well, then we don't know much about it. We don't know exactly where you're going. We don't know your speed. We don't necessarily know your altitude. And we've all gotten those call outs. We've all gotten call outs from air traffic control while we're flying that says no altitude, but we've got, we've got traffic at six o'clock, no idea whether he's on the ground or at 18,000 feet. So um, that's one to consider there uh, as well. And all of that comes back up through TISB. So what do we also do about these outliers? That's the other thing we're going to talk about, and that is this concept of active interrogation by uh, a uh, TAS system, which is a form of TCAS, uh, a, the existing active traffic interrogation system. So that is a system that works, that is totally outside of ADSB, where one transponder pings another transponder and gets a reply and a directional antenna on the aircraft figures out where is that? Where is that aircraft? And fits it all together. So it's a lot of information, but this is the overview that we're gonna be working within for the rest of the presentation. So let's, we're all here for ADSB, and we all know that the clock is ticking. So let's talk ADSB and symbology. One of the most important things, I think, in, in pilots that I've spoken to out there is a real understanding of what is the symbology that you're seeing and what does it all mean. Now, there can be some variations from manufacturer to manufacturer about what it is, but the FAA, uh, when they put together the standards that uh, ADSB systems are developed to, have guidelines that most of the systems adhere to. And they're pretty close to what you've got here. This comes out of the Lynx manual. And these are exactly what you would see with a Lynx 9000 system. So let's start in the upper left there. Then we'll, uh, we'll go through the symbols and I'll talk to you a little bit about where it comes from. So first of all, a, tra a moving traffic target is the arrowhead, the chevron that you see there. And they, the differences in the symbols that you see have to do with the proximity and the alerting of that traffic to you. So what you have to actually be concerned about. The first and most important one in the upper left is an airborne directional traffic advisory. So this is, regardless of its source, this is a critical uh, target that you need to look for that's going to come with an alert for you to look. It's in yellow, it's uh, in reverse, and it tells you the information that got that circle. So that's the most important thing. The next thing, now that would be a traffic advisory, a TA. The next thing down in blue is a filled chevron, and that is a proximity advisory. That's letting you know that it's close, that it is something that you want to pay attention to, and it's not being considered the immediate threat that a traffic advisory would be. And then the next one down being a hollow one, that is just other traffic. That's just letting you know. It doesn't happen to be on a course that you have to worry about right now, but it is something that you should be aware of, especially if it changes course or you change course. Then you have the last one, which is one that essentially is unmoving. Uh, now, uh, obviously, if you're cruising, that's one thing, but in most cases, uh, something that's unmoving could be be any number of, of things could be a helicopter hovering, but it's something that you need to know. We have no vector information on it. We don't know where it's actually going in that case. So those first three, those are the key ones where we know that we're dealing, we have ADSB targets, and so we know we can actually get information directly from them. And if you look in the next table over on the bottom two, you'll get information with most of those. 
that actually gives you the rest of the data for that ADSB symbol, that, for that aircraft. That's going to give you altitude relative to your altitude. It's going to give you, is it ascending or descending? And it's going to give you a vector flight path on there. It's going to show you where is this actually going. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. If you see a diamond, then you know you're looking at a non-ADSB target. And what's really important about a non-ADSB target on your screen is you need to kind of know what you don't know, which is just because all these other ones have arrows and directions and everything else, those are very e easily interpretable to say, oh, I get it, I know direction that he's going. When you see a diamond on your screen, that you only know the position of. It is moving, in, in, unless, it's, unless it's, it just happens to be hovering there. It's moving. And the problem is we don't know where, and we can't tell you exactly where. So all we can do is give you information about the proximity of that to you. And most of those are, again, going to be the only way you're going to get that information, one of two ways. You're going to find out about a non-ADSB target if you are within range of a ground station and the air traffic control system knows about that target, brings it down, and spits it back up to you on that thing we talked about before, which is TIS-B. The problem with that is you're not always in a radar environment. And so those non-participating aircraft, you're only going to see if you have proximity to that ground station. I'll talk about that a few times because that's pretty important. And the only other way you're going to know about that is if you have active traffic. Your own ability to act as a radar station, your own ability to ping another aircraft and get information about its position. Moving to the top of the right-hand column, we have all these ground things. Now, one of the things that's fascinating, if, if <laughs> I, I happen to have been involved in the avionics industry for quite some time, so I've seen things that have to do with all the standards and all the future of ADSB. And I will tell you it's fascinating because ADSB is not designed just for aircraft. It is designed to have beacons on top of cranes and towers and um, snow plows on runways and ships, which it is already on ships. And so it's for a lot of different things. And there are symbols for that that you will see in this kind of uh, brownish orange color over here. And those are ground-based uh, traffic things. And, and in most cases, unless you're pretty, pretty low, you're not going to see them because you don't want to see traffic on your display, of course, that's 5,000 feet below you. You only want to see it if you're, if you're pretty close. But it does give you the ability um, to distinguish between ground traffic and air traffic as well. Uh, so those are those symbols here. And now if we go across the bottom, you actually see the link system. You see what these things actually look like there. And if we look at the center one, there's a very, very important symbol I want to uh, point out to you and start with. It's that lower left-hand corner. You see a little radar in reverse, a little, it's a yellow or orange, and in reverse, you see a little radar tower in it. That is the TISB no coverage indicator. This means that your system is not receiving ground contact, a, ground, a signal from an ADSB ground station. When you see that symbol, I don't, you, 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 the symbol may be different on different companies' products, it doesn't matter, but when you see a symbol that tells you that you are out of your coverage area, which the Lynx does a great job of letting you know, it is very important to know that unless you have an active traffic system on board, you are not going to see those diamonds. And so you may be focused very clearly if you are, let's say you have an airport uh, that's a little bit in the valley and maybe it's not near a, a, a GBT, which is a ground-based transmitter. Um, and you're, you could be in the pattern. And there's three other aircraft in the pattern and two of them are equipped with ADSB. Well, if you have a, just a uh, system that only listens to ADSB. You're going to see two out of those three. You're not going to see the third. And it is very, very important that you are cognizant when you see that symbol that you're getting a picture, but it may not be the whole picture unless you have an active traffic system on board. Moving around the rest of the system here, it uh, tells you the mode that you're in as, as a uh, transponder. 
If you tap on any of the symbols that are on the screen here, any one of those that are an ADSB enabled system, and you can see here there's a circle in the uh, blue one that's 800 feet below you in the lower left, you tap on that, that uh, traffic's information is going to come up in the upper right. And that's giving you their tail number, their speed, um, some good information uh, there as well. And then uh, the rest of the thing is pretty self-evident here about what the transponder mode is, et cetera. So this is a good, uh, I think, uh, uh, page for you to be able to see um, some important key points uh, about um, what, uh, what you can do and what, how to interpret some of these symbols. Talk about ATAS. So, we, remember, we're, we're going to cover a bunch of different things, but ATAS is the alerting system that is built into the Lynx system and proprietary to the Lynx uh, NGT 9000. This is not active traffic, this is based on ADSB traffic. But what is really important here is that L3 has created on this system an algorithm and an alerting system for you that's audible, that detects what you need to pay attention to, what, what constitutes an alert. This is probably one of the biggest differences that I saw when flying behind a, a different ADSB uh, system before I switched over to the uh, 9000. When I uh, was previously flying with these uh, uh, ADSB systems, you would get a lot of nuisance alerts, uh, whether they were just just seeing them on the screen and getting like an alert by something that wasn't, maybe it was near you, but it wasn't in any way a threat because it was going the opposite direction or it was diverging from you or anything like that. The ATAS system from L3 that's built into this unit is an audio alerting system that actually can act tell when your paths are converging. So you could literally be flying in loose formation with another aircraft and not have an alert because your paths are not converging. And yet you could have another aircraft that's much farther away but is on a converging path with you and so is extremely concerning. And you're going to get that alert. The one that sees right here, traffic, traffic, 8 o'clock, high, 2 miles, you will look and hopefully you will see it and be able to take action. It is a very uh, interesting system in the, uh, I don't know what's behind it in terms of what the rules are that it follows. I can only tell you that I am always pleasantly surprised when it doesn't go off on things that are not concerning and not a risk, and it makes you pay attention on the ones that are a risk. And it, uh, it has uh, saved my bacon more than once and so I, I am a real big fan of the ATAS system. Uh, it gives you both visual, as you can see here, those, uh, those of TAs, those tra traffic alerts that you see of that system. And the other thing that's really important is, a, uh, is something that is quite different from this system versus some others that are out there is uh, a lot of those just shut off when you get close to the traffic pattern, when you start dealing with 2,000 feet and below AGL. And uh, the ATAS system, because it distinguishes the difference between being close to someone versus being on a converging path with someone, the ATAS system will report all the way to the ground. And that's very, very important distinction because that's where so many of these accidents happen is in the traffic pattern. And one way or another, you're either going to become numb to it if you are flying with a system that's going to be yelling at you all the time when you're in the traffic pattern, or you're just not going to have it at all. And so it is really something to know the difference between having three aircraft in the traffic pattern, none of which are in converging flight pads, versus something where two people have turned on maybe high wing, low wing situation or something like that, and you really, really need to know what's going on. So ATAS is built in, very important system. Talk now about active traffic. Active traffic has many different levels of, uh, of what it does. If you look at the airlines, they use TCAS systems. That's a, a very specific term. 
um, and uh, business jets, airliners do it. They're very, they're expensive systems in most cases. Um, but what's really key here, the base level of the technology is that an aircraft sends out the same type of signal that a ground radar station would send out, asking for a reply from a transponder. So we all learned in our flight training that we can look down at our transponder, a little light blinks every time it is pinged from the ground. And that is an interrogation is what we like to call it in the avionics side. So you get your transponder gets interrogated and it sends a reply. And the reply is nothing more in that case than saying this is my altitude and here I am. Um, from a regular transponder, it's not sending out your GPS location. That was what ADSB is all about. So instead, the aircraft has to triangulate, where are you? I know your altitude, where are you? And so it sends this constant kind of Marco Polo out there and getting answers from anyone nearby and then triangulating their position. And again, that message includes their altitude already. At a TCAS level, at the level that gets dealt with by airliners, not only does it figure out the position, but it also actually has what's called a resolution uh, alert that comes out and tells each aircraft, the pilot of each aircraft, which way to turn so they, uh, it's not one of those things where you're walking down a hallway and both people step in the same direction. Um, so that is highly coordinated. Now, TAS is available with the L3 and GT9000 system, and TAS is basically everything that you would get with a TCAS system without that resolution, without instructing um, you how to avoid hitting that aircraft, but actually giving you the information on that. And so what's really important about that is that you have this ability to combine active traffic with ADSB traffic and display both on the screen at the same time. And that technology is already built into the hardware of the unit. So it's it's already there. It's basically similar to what you know Skywatch and other systems were out there. If you happen to have a Skywatch system, you can display here on uh, the NGT 9000. But when we go back to that scenario we were talking about where you're out of range, you are in a, a, a valley airport or you're not near an, uh, a GBT and you're flying around, you see the ADSB traffic and you wouldn't necessarily see the other traffic. If you have an NGT 9000 plus, and that's the unit that is enhanced with a directional antenna and enables active traffic, the TAS system, you're going to see all three aircraft, not just two out of the three. Um, our aircraft has the NGT 9000 plus. We have active, an active traffic antenna on it, which means, and, and I have seen those situations happen more than once where I am flying into an airport where in the traffic pattern, first thing, step one, I've got that uh, orange or yellow radar symbol that says that I am out of TISB coverage, I'm not receiving a ground station, and then I see those diamonds show up. And I know at that point in time that that means there is non-ADSB traffic, I'm out of range, and the only reason I'm seeing that aircraft is because I have active traffic on board. Uh, there, uh, we'll have a recording of the presentation, you'll be able to look in more detail, but the details about your own ship position and ground speed and when other aircraft are detected are in that chart to your right. And this also gives you some information here about the difference between sensitivities and distances between what you would get in alerts from ADSB and the built-in ATAS traffic alert on your left versus if you add the option for active traffic and what you see on the right-hand side with task alerting. So with that, um, that gives you some of my experience uh, on it, some important points about uh, the difference between active traffic and ADSB traffic, some of the things to consider and what some of the symbols mean. I'd like to add something really briefly that, uh, that I missed. I'm going to step a few slides back here because there's something I think is pretty important to point out to you. And that is 
we take a look here in this upper right image where you actually see the vectors coming out, one of the things that I didn't go into a little bit more detail on is that vector path. So you see those arrowheads and those chevrons, and you have coming out of the nose of them a straight line. Now, that straight line is the path of that aircraft, but it's more than the path of the aircraft. The length of the line that's coming out has to do with the speed of the aircraft, and it's not random. With the L3 system, that is showing you the tip of that line is where that aircraft is going to be 20 seconds from now. That's pretty important because that's a 20 second lead on where its trend is going to be so you can plan ahead and see where those paths are. And so that's important because faster aircraft are going to have longer symbols. And you may see one aircraft that looks like it's close to you but has a very small line coming out of the front and maybe it's not going anywhere fast. And one that looks that it's much farther away from you and isn't something that you necessarily should be concerned about, but that has a long vector and perhaps that that's a business jet that is coming right into your path at, you know, 300 knots and really something you have to worry about. And so that is, again, something else about interpreting and understanding the symbology that I want to make sure that everyone is very, very aware of. Different manufacturers' products may use different distances and different times on that. Um, I am quite comfortable with the 20-second lead time that's provided by the link system. That's what I'm used to, and that's what it means if you have this system. So with that, I'd like to have uh, Dennis join us. Dennis, are you on the line? I am, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, and we will, uh, I'll hand it over to Dennis, and then we will, uh, I'll, I'll, I don't do a good job staying quiet, so I'll certainly pipe in with my experience along the way. Okay, terrific. Thank you, Jeff. Hey, I'm very honored to be here this evening to talk about the Lynx product line. Um, <clears throat> L3 has been a big player in the ADSB world over the last decade. We've got a strong uh, heritage in the military, air transport, and business jet worlds. And um, in our G GA space, we are so proud of this Lynx product. So I'm very honored to be able to talk to you about it. Um, so many of you are simply entertaining pulling out your old transponder and looking to install an ADSB-compliant transponder in order to meet the upcoming FAA mandate. And if you're flying overseas, the, the YASA mandate. Um, many of you are focusing on price and installation, and some folks, you know, that's a terrific solution. Um, as you've heard from Jeff, you know, um, having ADS-B out is quite a safety jump as uh, your aircraft is essentially visible in real time to ATC and other ADS-B aircraft with position and velocity and data transmitted every second. That is, in itself is a big deal. Um, so ADSB is is quite the safety step, uh, and and the effort uh, from the regulators over the last decade needs to be applauded. Um, but before you take that path, and as you look at taking out a simple 1.3 by 6 inch product out of your panel, um, you know I really want to talk to you about what you can put in that to replace it and the significance. Uh, of the links and all of the uh, the dedication to hazards and, and all of the services that it provides. The Lynx uh, uh, NGT 9000 is an integrated multifunctioning surveillance solution. It's much more than a MODES ADSB compliant transponder. It does a lot more than just meet the ADSB mandate, as Jeff has just pointed out. Uh, and it's a quick installation. Simply slides into your old transponder slot. The Lynx is both ADSB out and in. I think for the purpose of this discussion, I'm going to assume that most people know the difference. And if you don't, quite frankly, Wikipedia does a great job defining it. There's other resources or simply send us an email. We can send you some document documentation on the difference between out and in. But for this conversation, ADSB in is where you get the free stuff. The, uh, the ADSB weather and traffic from the FAA if you're flying in the U.S., uh, commonly re referred to as TISB and FISB. Um, all of the icons shown below are functions and enablements that can be displayed on the links, which includes weather traffic, uh, TAFs, TFRs, NOTAMs, um, terrain and optical databases. 
uh, collision avoidance, et cetera. So uh, the Lynx pulls a lot of data together in one very small multifunction display, or one very um, in your standard panel mount unit. The multifunction display is a beautiful glass touchscreen interface that allows you to swiftly move data in and out of view in order to display the visual data needed when it is needed. It's really quite awesome. Let's take a look uh, on the next slide. And let's start with the basics. Um, so if you look at the upper left, uh, you can change views easily by simply swiping left or right in order to bring into view a display that's most meaningful at that particular phase of flight. Um, as you can see in the top left image on the left side of the display, a traditional display interface with a squawk code presented and the ident. Uh, using the touchscreen interface, you can easily enter a unique squawk code by simply touching the display and a keyboard will appear. You simply punch in your squawk code and ident. What's really great about this system is once you've punched in your code, you don't need to dedicate that real estate any longer. You can swipe that out of view and you then have a left and right side to use to present better information. But once you've, uh, so essentially once you've pushed that out of sight, we can bring in weather, traffic, no tans, and additional data. If you're flying in a congested airspace, just swipe and display your traffic. If you're flying low and close to terrain, display your terrain vision or your TAWS B. There's a couple terrain options to choose from. Also free with links is a great safety product that Jeff talked about with the ATAS that provides both visual and oral alerting. And that's a really significant uh, safety application, um, especially providing alerts all the way to the ground where lots of our competition uh, stops alerting at 2,000 feet AGL. Uh, so uh, pilots will display different pages based on what phase of flight they're in, gives you a lot of data and provides pilots with choices. Um, Jeff, I think you could probably give us a couple of examples and uh, I'll throw it back to you for a couple a couple comments. Well, I mean, it, you know, it's 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 called a multi-hazard system, obviously, for a reason. I, I have uh, been fortunate to be able to fly in a bunch of different environments and, and use it. And it, I, I like the versatility and the fact that you can actually go and, uh, you know, in, in mountainous terrain, use it for the terrain side. And other, I, I literally, the, I'll tell you the way that I use it, the left-hand side of the screen when it looks like a transponder there in the upper left version, that is at the beginning of the flight, and that's pretty much at the only time that I actually have that displayed. That's because I like using those two different panels. Uh, uh, I probably have it most often set up the way it is in the upper right, um, with the exception of swapping that right pane over to things like terrain, et cetera, when, um, when, that, when that becomes critical, depending on my flight area. And, and of course, locking up the METARS tasks, et cetera, also. I use traffic always in the left and, um, and really work that right-hand pane as much as possible. Terrific. Okay, next slide. Okay, terrain vision is an option with the LINK system. Uh, this is both a terrain and obstacle awareness system has a worldwide database and can be flown with both a, a fixed wing or helicopter. This is a great safety feature. Uh, also, we have a more robust uh, uh, Class B TAWS, which provides both visual and oral alerts. And this is uh, available, I think, at an MRSP of $4,000. Next slide. So a big part of the Link system is its interoperability with other devices. Um, the Link interfaces nicely with other components. It's got an AirRink 429, RS-232, and a 422 protocol. The Link has an embedded WASH GPS. It communicates with many MFDs and PFDs, and it has a Wi-Fi module to talk to your tablet apps. Uh, you're going to want to check with your dealer regarding interfacing with additional equipment on board your aircraft. Um, other noteworthy points, let's talk about antennas. Uh, you can use existing transponder antennas. The Lynx has an embedded WASH GPS, as mentioned, and therefore you need a GPS antenna. 
if you already have a WASP GPS antenna uh, for your navigator, you can use a GPS splitter or a coupler and avoid having to buy a new GPS antenna. Uh, the, the Lynx comes with a Wi-Fi dongle device that allows you to interface with your tablet applications, including ForeFlight, Wing X Pro, uh, Flight Plan Go, FlyQ, um, which is the AOPA application. However, we do not display to the Garmin Pilot due to restrictions uh, in place from Garmin. Um, some other uh, points that might impact your buying decision, the Lynx is a dual band 1090-978 transponder. You want to make sure you have both. You want the free services provided from the FAA on 978, which is UAG, but you also want 1090 for all your non-GA traffic if you're flying above 18,000 feet, for example, in Class A. If you want to go on vacation in Mexico or Canada, guess what? There's no UAT in those countries. Actually, you won't even be legal without uh, 1090. Um, so we feel confident that you're, the right solution is to have a uh, at both frequencies in the same unit. Um, diversity is also uh, something worth mentioning. It's not needed in the US, and that simply means you're going to have an antenna both top and bottom. It is required in Europe. Um, it does give you uh, a little bit more faster uh, churn rate for ADSB responses. If you want more information about diversity, please visit our website. Um, and uh, next slide. And so as we we created a little chart to compare ourselves against the uh, the GTX 345 from Garmin. As this chart illustrates on the right side, we have all the check marks are in blue, and the Garmin GTX 345 uh, does not have those checked. Let's go through those. There's a lot of no's. The Garmin does not display ADSB traffic or weather. They do not have a touchscreen interface. They don't display TF TFRs, METARs or TAFs, NOTAMs, winds aloft, et cetera. Um, we have a TAWS and a TKS-1 capability as an add-on. Um, you'll notice from the price point that I think we have a competitive price position over Garmin. Garmin does have all these capabilities and they build great products. However, you'd have to buy multiple units to get all of this capability. Another value driver for L3, um, we do provide a three-year warranty where many of the comp competitors out there provide a two-year warranty, as does Garmin. Next slide. So I'll try to summarize things up here for you guys, and thanks for your patience. The ADSB, the reasons to buy links, uh, well, number one, it meets the mandate. It's ADSB out compliant, MODES transponder. It has a beautiful, and uh, yeah, I, I, I'm a pilot with about 600 hours. Uh, this just has a beautiful display interface, glass interface. Uh, with the UAT, we get the free weather and the free traffic from the FAA. Um, the navigation is so user-friendly, easy one-swipe navigation for your weather, your traffic, your TFRs, your METARs, etc. ATAF is a great uh, um, add-on. And um, if you have a storm scope with us, the WX500, you can also display your lightning detection pages through the link system. Skywatch users, if you have that equipage, avoid costly repairs by upgrading to links with active traffic, and you can remove your old Skywatch uh, LRU and save uh, significant weight on your aircraft. Um, and it's upgradable to, to a terrain product, whether it's terrain vision or uh, Class B TAWS. So now we have a special offer for you folks. If you could go one more slide. For attending, we are, um, you are all eligible to get the terrain, the terrain vision product free of charge for participating today. And all you need to do is we will have a list from this webinar. And um, if you tell your installer that you've attended this and if they put that on the purchase order, we will compare it to the list. And if indeed you participated in this webinar, well, guess what? You just got an $895 value with the terrain vision product. And this enablement will be uh, be yours for attending today. Um, we have a couple other promotions. If you could advance to the next slide. Um, these promotions are underway. 
and are, um, are in effect until May 31st. We have the active traffic at a 40% discount and um, uh, the, the active traffic ETAWS bundle at 50% off. So take advantage of that before May 31st. And our last slide. Um, you can purchase the links through our website and you can also, our, um, our part 23 um, dealer is Aspen Avionics and you see their contact information there. If you have any questions, feel free to email us. We'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. It's a great product and, uh, and we hope you take a good look at it when you look to make your purchase for your uh, uh, ADSB solution. Thank you, folks. I'll hand it Thanks back to you, Thanks very Jeff. much. I would encourage anyone who does have questions to contact uh, L3 directly. You could reach them at uh, their uh, support or their direct number is available on their website. There's lots of great information on here. I'm happy to field more questions personally also on my own experience with it. And of course, I would like to thank Dennis McCall for joining us this evening and bringing us all this great information. Um, it, all of this is very helpful. I am really not, a, you know, I, I get excited about it. I can certainly come across probably as a little salesy, but I don't have a direct association that way, and I don't work for L3. It really comes from experience of seeing the difference between having what I had before for traffic system and, uh, you know, you fly around and you have yourself uh, saved from a couple mid airs, you become an evangelist pretty quickly. And I, because of that, happen to be a, a huge fan of the importance of both uh, ADSB traffic and also of having active traffic put on it. it. It has made a difference in my life, and that is really why I am so passionate about it. So I would like, again, to thank everyone for joining us this evening. I'd like to tell, thank L3 for, for the presentation and also for providing the uh, benefit of the uh, software upgrade for anyone who leaves this presentation and chooses to go buy an L3 Links system. And for Social Flight, I'm Jeff Simon. Please go check out the app. It is free, and it gives everybody wonderful chances to see what your next flying adventure is going to be. And so until our next webinar, I'd like to thank you and blue skies to everyone. Have a wonderful weekend. Good night.